Hi, how are you? Welcome back to my little channel where I try and talk about things of interest to me that may be of interest to you. This story today is one that people hear and they go, how come we never heard that before? It's a story where the history of Ireland, England, Australia, America all intersect. It's the story of a whaling ship that left New Bedford in Massachusetts to go whaling and also to break out some prisoners from a penal colony in Western Australia. Fenian prisoners. Let's get into it. Let's talk about the word Fenian. Um, the Fenian Brotherhood, the Fenian movement in the late 19th and early 20th century was a, an Irish political movement. But the term Fenian uh, refers to a very old uh, legendary body of warriors that we now call the Fianna. Um, the Fianna were a standing army, kind of like a special forces army. You had to pass all these rigorous tests to be accepted into it. And uh, the High King of Ireland would have this army on call and they would often be called to repel invaders or the King of the World or somebody would turn up to invade Ireland the Fianna would respond. There's a whole body of mythology about the Fianna um, rivaling the Norse mythology or the Arthurian legends. Uh, great stories. I might do a video on them one time. And uh, the images you know, I'm showing here now, by the way, are from Jim Fitzpatrick, the artist probably well known for doing the, uh, the Thin Lizzy album covers. He's also the guy who did the first stylized two-tone image of Che Guevara that was copied everywhere. Um, all through the 70s and he, he recently was able to establish copyright on that and presented it to the Cuban people. Um, Jim Fitzpatrick, great artwork. That's who the, the Fenians were, but nobody uses the term Fenians for that, those people anymore. We now call them the Fianna, the original Irish term, because the Fenian movement, which named itself after them, uh, became so important uh, in history that uh, for the sake of confusion, we talking about the Fenians being the 18th, 19th century and early 20th century movement. It was a movement that started in America. There was an awful lot of Irish in America um, through the 1800s, but particularly after the famine. The Irish famine was horrendous. Um, broadly speaking, there was about a million people died of starvation and disease and Two million people emigrated from a, a tiny country. The population still isn't anywhere near what it was before the famine. It was a, it was a hugely traumatic effect on the country. Um, and it was still exporting food to Britain, the way things were at the time. A lot of people left feeling very bitter about the way Ireland was treated during the famine. So when you had tens, hundreds of thousands, millions, two million people of Irish origin around the world. They had their natural antipathy to British rule was exaggerated or enhanced by the, uh, the famine and the effect of that. There was a lot of intent on another uprising, yet another uprising against British rule. There was two organizations started together. The Fenian Brotherhood was formed in America and the, the Irish Republican Brotherhood they're both basically sister organizations. They come under the umbrella term, the Fenians. And uh, that was formed in, the Irish Republican Brotherhood was formed in Ireland. And it got its roots deep into the uh, British army. Um, it was a secret sworn society. It was very hush-hush, undercover. Now in America, it was much more open, but in, in Ireland, it was all very hush-hush. And there was a garrison, there was about 23,000 troops in the British Army in Ireland at the time. A lot of Irish regiments, obviously. Um, I think seven or 8,000 of them were signed up to the Fenians. In America, in 1865, they were able to march 6,000 men in uniform. So there was significant numbers of people. A lot of the American Fenians had military experience in the American Civil War. A lot of the Fenians in Ireland, obviously, those who were in the military, had military experience. So there was a capacity for a major rebellion. 
The rebellion was set for 1867. Unfortunately, it was riddled with informers in Ireland. So in America, people left, sailed to Ireland, expecting to come off the ships and join a serious battle for Irish freedom. Uh, when they got here, there was nothing happening. The leaders had all been rounded up. The regiments that were riddled with Fenians were moved out of the country. Um, there were a lot of arrests. Um, there was some fighting, nothing much. So you were left with a lot of Fenian prisoners. There was not so many informers in the army, so there wasn't so many military prisoners taken, but the leadership, a lot of the leaders within the army were. What happened then was these prisoners were shipped away, transported to Australia. The military Fenians were sentenced to death. Those sentences were commuted to life imprisonment, transported to Australia. They went on the ship, the Hougamont, a French ship. It took them months to get there. Now, a lot of people don't realise about transporting to Australia. The thing about transporting to Australia was um, it wasn't Britain deciding its prisons were overflowing. There were prison hulks floating in the Thames. They needed to do something so they'll ship them away to their colony in Australia. There was no colony in Australia. The fleet that went down after James Cook mapped the coast, the fleet that went down was a fleet carrying prisoners, a fleet of convicts. The first fleet was a convict fleet to set up the convicts and tradesmen and people like that to set up the colony from scratch. Ships, a lot of people, Irish people don't realise, ships went directly from Ireland. It wasn't just Irish people going from British prisons or anything, but a lot of Irish went directly from Ireland. The first ship direct from Ireland was called the Queen, went from Cove, and it had about 300 men, a couple of dozen women, seven people died on board. Of the men, this was in the 1790s, of the men, half of them were dead by the end of the first year in Australia. It was tough, it was tough. Um, it was a little better by the, t the 1860s when the, uh, the Hugomo went. Um, the last Irish ship went from Dunleary in 1865. The Hougamont was the, 1868, was the final convict ship to go to Australia. Uh, carried 320 normal prisoners and carried 63 Fenians, of whom 17 were military Fenians. They were given three days to recover after they got there. Oh, by the way, on the way out, they, um, they were treated reasonably well because they weren't your common or garden criminal for off the streets. They were... Uh, they were more educated and literate um, generally and uh, being in leadership positions in this political movement. They were the type that uh, got on well with the crew and the captain. The military prisoners were supposed to be locked in with the standard uh, criminals, but they were allowed out to join their, their comrades on deck, um, only being locked up at night. And the Fenians produced a magazine, a weekly magazine on board called the the wild goose, which was uh, appreciated by the officers and men of the ship. Now, uh, they got to Fremantle. They had three days recovery, after which they went to work parties. They were detailed to work parties. Prisoners in Fremantle were doing all the civil work. They were cutting roads through the bush. They were building piers. They were building lighthouses. Any kind of physical, civic work was being done by prisoners to build up the colony. This was quite, a, quite, an, a, quite a shock to the system for people from Western Europe. <clears throat> Dealing with the heat, the punishing heat, the snakes, the insects, the mosquitoes, all the rest of it. Um, and obviously being prisoners, the food probably would have been dodgy. But anyway, they were, uh, they were put to this work. Eventually, there was political activity in Ireland and Britain that resulted in uh, Gladstone came to power and he was anxious to, to do something about trying to resolve the Irish question. So the, the civilian Fenians were eventually given a conditional release. Uh, the condition was that they, they were basically banished, they couldn't be in the British Isles. So civilian Fenian prisoners went from Perth, from Fremantle over to, they weren't allowed into Adelaide, they weren't allowed into Melbourne, they went to Sydney, and many of them went from there to the States. Um, prisoners in the British Isles went to the States. Now in the States, there was still a huge 
support for the whole Fenian movement, for the idea of doing something for Irish freedom, but also doing something for these prisoners, the military Fenians that were condemned to life imprisonment because the condition release did not apply to them. They had, they had reneged on their oath to the king, so uh, they were not going to get an easy ride. They were uh, still doing hard labour in Fremantle. A lot of people felt something should be done to try and rescue them, but it seemed an impossible task. The Fenians were, uh, did a couple of strange things in America, in North America. They invaded Canada. There were about five incursions into Canada by Fenians, three of which were fairly serious with hundreds of men involved. Um, the idea being that they would try and disrupt communications in Canada, basically screw up the colony and use that to barter for freedom for Ireland. A um, bit optimistic, but uh, they did it. And uh, they were given a reasonable amount of support and sympathy from the American public because a lot of Americans, well, they remembered the American Revolution. They remembered the War of 1812. They remembered the fact that Britain had backed the Confederacy in the Civil War. <clears throat> and also, some of them regarded Canada as unfinished business, that all of North America should be free from British rule. So there was a certain amount of tolerance of what the Fenians were doing in America. Those Fenians in America who had settled and taken jobs did quite well for themselves. Um, John Devoy, who had been the organiser in Ireland of the IRB, he ended up working in a newspaper um, in New York and uh, other Fenians were becoming prominent in uh, political circles. Um, so they had a certain amount of power in, in America. Certainly they had a network uh, of, of connections. Now one of the military Fenians escaped, a fellow called John Boyle O'Reilly, a very interesting chap. He had uh, left Ireland, got depressed and got into the newspaper business, uh, became a journalist, uh, started in print, became a printing press, end of it, but became a journalist. Preston. Then he returned home and he joined the 10th Hussars in Ireland. Um, possibly, like many, he was trying to get military experience for a future rebellion, just to have it under his belt. Um, but it was in the 10th Hussars he was arrested, condemned. And in Australia, he found it tough. He, uh, even though he had a better position than most, he found the whole idea of life imprisonment uh, ahead of him extremely daunting. But he had arrived, um, been dispatched to Bunbury for a work party and the warder in Bunbury had been quite sympathetic to him and realised that this was no common criminal and uh, so he'd used him as a clerk, uh, as a messenger, he eventually became a, what they technically was a probationary constable, uh, being a courier carrying messages and so he'd given a horse a certain amount of freedom. He, uh, he had developed a bit of a romance with the warder's daughter um, which may or may not have been unrequited. Certainly he was writing poems about her and they had some connection. <clears throat> but his future was, was grim. And at one point he tried to commit suicide, cut his wrists, was found. Was, he recovered and he poured his heart out to the local priest, a fellow called Father Pat McCabe. And Father McCabe basically said to him, look, you know, you can't, you can't escape. He, he was determined to, to go to the bush or go to sea, get out somehow, make a boat, anything. McCabe explained to him that that was ludicrous. That was just a, another form of suicide. He told him to hang tight and he would have sort something out for him. So McCabe, Father McCabe used his own money, got him a, a passage on an American whaler. It's a bit of a story, short, long story short, American whaler, took him away and on that whaler he became very good friends with uh, the second mate, a guy called uh, Henry Hathaway. <clears throat> so he made it as a sailor, worked his way as a sailor through Liverpool, keeping his head down, made it to America. And then he became, uh, got into journalism, became a poet, uh, wrote a novel based on his experiences, became very well known in America um, and very active in the Fenian business and uh, he was the he was in the, the Boston pilot he became editor-in-chief and um, so he was a quite an important man he even when the Americans were dedicating the 
a, a monument to P Plymouth Rock, it was John Boyle O'Reilly they turned to for the, the verse for this. You know, he was, he was quite well known. Um, actually, he had left the Fenian movement at one stage with other important Fenians in America, apparently at the behest of the Archbishop, because the Catholic Church, ironically, seeing the way Fenian is sometimes used as a slur for Catholics in some parts, um, you could be excommunicated from the Catholic Church for being a Fenian. Pope Pius IX uh, and the, the hierarchy in Rome were dead set against any kind of revolutionary movement, any kind of movement that suggested power to the people was anathema to uh, the power in Rome. Um, they had had a rough deal with Garibaldi and the, uh, the revolutionaries in Italy and they'd seen what happened with the French Revolution which aside from all the bloodletting had brought in a lot of progressive things. Um, America had been set up with separation of church and state. So <clears throat> Catholic Church dead set against any kind of revolution. The existing powers that be were to be maintained. People were to respect aristocrats. Pope Pius IX published a thing called the Syllabus of Errors, which listed all the things that were bad. Free speech, civil marriage, civil education without church involvement, treating all religions as if they're equal, separation of church and state, um, bad, bad, bad. And the Catholic Church in Ireland was Riding on the coattails to some extent of the British Empire, um, between 30 and 40 percent of British troops around the world <coughs> were Irish Catholics. So everywhere they went, Catholic churches were built, priests went. Um, the Catholic Church in Ireland was trying to get a Catholic university built to provide educated people to serve the British Empire. Uh, that was one of their one of their arguments for it. Um, so. They did not want either the uh, the status quo being upset. They didn't know what would happen if they opened Pandora's box and had some revolutionary movement take power. So it was not uh, accepted acceptable to the Catholic Church if you to, we were a Fenian. Now, priests on the ground were quite different. Priests like Father Pat McCabe in Fremantle, in, Bun in Bunbury. Uh, there was one particular Archbishop in Ireland actually who was sympathetic to the Fenians. Um, Archbishop Croke, who was very involved in sport as well, which is why the big stadium in Dublin is now called Croke Park. So, John Boyle O'Reilly arrived in America after his release, and that kick started this whole idea of maybe getting people away to see the remaining military Fenians. They raised money, Boyle O'Reilly introduced them to Henry Hathaway, who'd been the second mate. Hathaway said, look, what you need to do is buy a ship. Buy a ship, go to sea on a whaling voyage and then grab these prisoners and get away. He introduced them to a man called Richardson and Richardson was uh, in New Bedford. Richardson was uh, a guy who funded whaling voyages and wheeled and dealed a bit in the whole whaling business. And he knew just a man, his son-in-law, a fellow called George Anthony, married to his daughter. Anthony had just got married, had a young baby daughter, was trying to give up the sea, um, had picked a job trying to run a machine shop, um, getting his head around this, but he was, he'd was he been a whaling captain. Um, so the, the Fenians approached him, they sat down with him, Richardson introduced them, they all sat down and they had a chat. They explained the, the plight of the military Fenians. He was quite sympathetic to that. Also, they were offering him that he would get three times what the normal captain's take would be from a whaling voyage and also an extra bonus from the Fenians as well. And it's kind of like the idea of doing one last job, you know. So he said he'd do it. I believe his wife was not too happy. So they went looking for a ship. They found a ship, the Catalpa. The word Catalpa, by the way, means tree, the type of tree. Uh, it's a type of tree, the Catalpa tree. So anyway, they found a ship, the Catalpa, for sale in Boston, had been plying its trade as a merchant vessel, had been adapted as a merchant vessel from a whaler and its previous voyage bringing logwood up from the uh, West Indies. They bought it, spent about 20 grand fitting it out as a whaler again and eventually they went to sea. 
They had one Fenian on board, a fella called Duggan, who'd been involved in the Rising in Dublin and made her way to America. He had been a coach builder, so they put him on as the carpenter. So he sailed as the carpenter. There was a crew of 23, the captain plus 23. And second mate was a man called Sam Smith, a very uh, solid, capable, reliable, highly thought of first mate, um, which is what first mates generally are. Um, in case you don't know, uh, the captain doesn't run a ship to a greater or lesser extent, depending on the vessel. It's the first mate who runs the ship and provides the captain with a working ship to decide what to do with. Uh, that's usually the way things go. Uh, first mate's really important position on a ship. Sam Smith was not told when they sailed what the mission was to be. Nobody knew, only the captain and Duggan, the carpenter. They sailed. They went whaling. Meanwhile, there was another operation being set up, the land side of it. The Fenians in America found a guy, Breslin, John J. Breslin. He had been the night supervisor of a prison hospital in Dublin that had helped James Stevens, one of the Fenian leaders, escape. Um, and they decided they would send him to Australia. He was good enough, well-spoken enough to pass himself off as a wealthy American investor. And they sent uh, so much money had been raised in San Francisco. The people in California, the Irish Fenians in California, wanted one of their people involved. So they sent a man, another very capable man, a fellow called Desmond. He was uh, Desmond was from uh, Cove, Tom Desmond, and uh, another coach builder actually. Um, so he would travel with Breslin. They would travel together, but not. They would travel on the same vessels, but not that on there together um, and uh, these were men two men that had proven themselves in, in tight spots in the in the rebellion um, so that was the land part they would contact the convicts and they would set up the escape from the land side mm -hmm. there was also a man called Brennan <clears throat> who one of the major fundraisers Goff had wanted on board Anthony wouldn't take a second Irishman, he thought it would look odd. So Brennan set off to meet them in the Azores and joined there. As it turned out, he didn't, and he ended up making his own way to Australia. So the ship was off whaling. In the Azores, they lost a couple of men. Uh, a couple of men absconded, <coughs> two or three. <coughs> so Anthony had to replace them by doing a deal with some of the dodgy characters that provided crews to ships from from men who had absconded from other ships so they, uh, they they sailed from the Azores he was going to take his ship it was rather strange he expected the crew were going to start smelling a rat they went towards Tenerife and they were going from Tenerife they were going to go around into the Indian Ocean but before he got to Tenerife he needed to sit Sam Smith down and explain what they were at so we brought him into the cabin and they sat down and he explained, and uh, according to his account of it, basically he laid out what was happening, he laid out the plight of the Fenian prisoners, and uh, he told them what, what they were doing, and Sam Smith stood up, shook his hand, and said he'd follow him to hell itself, if it burns our jib boom, I'm with you all the way, kind of thing. Very dramatic scene, and uh, they sailed on. At Tenerife, they loaded lumber, and Doug and the carpenter began to knock up cabins for the prisoners they hoped to, to rescue. The story of the 23 crew that, that he had, half were American, of the other half, they were a mixture of what were described as blacks and Malays. And from the documents I've seen, it looks like they were West Indians and Malays. Um, West Indians rather than African Americans, I think. But uh, they were to be told when they got to Australia that they were going to, take some people who are wanting to pay money to get to America, no more than that. So on they sailed. Steve, uh, Breslin and Desmond arrived in Australia. Desmond got a job near Fremantle. Breslin paraded around looking to invest, sniffing out gold mines and sheep stations and whatever else that a wealthy American might invest in in this growing burgeoning colony 
he met the governor, he met the people around the prisons, he was, uh, he was fated, um, he had some kind of an affair, uh, he, he saw the prisoners when he went to mass, he would see the prisoners. Um, and he eventually was able to get in contact. There was a lot of ticket of leave men who were men who had served their time as prisoners in the colony and then were allowed to work on farms or do it, you know, set up their own bit of uh, a settlement uh, holding, small holding. And uh, these ticket of leave men would have been, would have known the deal and been able to talk to prisoners. And he was able to suss out a way of communicating with the military Fenians. Around about the same time, two men turned up from the British Isles with money to also try and rescue the prisoners. They were sussing out the same people. So everybody was sussing everybody out then. And then they realised they were all on the same page. And the, the two guys that had come from the British Isles said, look, you take our money and we'll help you and we, how, how we can. So when the escape was to happen, these men were to cut the telegraph wires either side and then try and make their own escape. There was also a fellow called King turned up from New Zealand from New Zealand Fenians with money they had raised to try and help with the scheme to get the prisoners away. So there was a lot of people working towards the same end. Now before getting to Western Australia, Captain Anthony knew he was going to need charts. He had none. He encountered a vessel at sea. The weather was really good. They stopped, they chatted. He visited with the captain of the other vessel and he intended to ask him for some charts of Western Australia if he had any. To spare, the captain, during the chat, explained to him that he had once taken a convict ship called the Hougamon down to Western Australia and he told him the story of how he had Fenian prisoners on board who had produced a magazine, which was, uh, which was uh, kind of ironic because Ca Anthony then asked him had he any charts that could help him in his voyage? And the captain happily shared charts of Western Australia, which was nice. And uh, on they went. Catalpa finally got there in 1876. Uh, it was, they came ashore, Anthony came ashore, very tentatively made inquiries and met up with Breslin and they hatched their plan. It was organised for Monday, Easter Monday, 1876. They'd been there five years at this stage. There were six prisoners they were going to break out. That's, what, that's who were still left there. Uh, one seventh that they would have taken had died. There were two more that they left. One was suspected, a suspected informer and one was a bit of a raving alcoholic that they couldn't trust. So those two men were left. The six men they, they, they were to take were on different work parties and luckily had not been posted up the country at that time. So they were all available and they all had jobs in and around the prison. So Breslin used the money he had. He bought horses, uh, traps, those two wheel carts, um, a couple of carts, four wheel carts. Um, he had bought arms, he bought clothes. Um, so they stashed all these in certain locations. The prisoners knew where. On Easter Monday morning, the prisoners were to get up and make their way to these various ve vehicles and head to a place that had been identified by Anthony as the likely, the best place to pick them up. And it's a place called Rockingham. Um, it's a bit of a distance away, so that's why they needed the, the transport. Anthony had come ashore Easter Sunday in his whale boat. Him, him, he, the captain, had left Sam Smith keeping Catalpa three miles offshore. They came ashore. They spent the night ashore and in the morning they saw a party of men turn up in Rockingham with a load of lumber that looked like it was going to be collected by a ship. And it turned out that, yes, the Georgette, the local patrol boat, was coming to collect this lumber. So that was a bit of a, a fly in the ointment, but they could do, they could do nothing about it. And the Georgette was a steamer, had sails as well, had been built on the Clyde and had been bought by the colony of Western Australia and was used for all kinds of things. Uh, general runabout, 
um, had, could have an artillery piece put on. Um, in this case, it came along uh, expecting to, to pick up lumber, stumbled into this escape. Um, Monday morning, the prisoners walked out. Those who didn't have jobs outside the prison were able to come up with convincing excuses, got them out, out the gate, and they went to various work locations nearby where there had been stashed these, ve these vehicles. So the guys at the beach saw these horses and carts and traps approaching, um, pell-mell, uh, fellas waving guns, uh, the guys with the guns jumped out of the carts, they were the prisoners and their helpers. There was 10 Irishmen altogether in that whale boat going back to the Catalpa. Anyway, there was enough of them, they had guns, they were frantic, they knew it wouldn't be long before all hell was going to break loose and they were going to be tailed. So they held up at gunpoint the guys with the lumber. Then everybody explained who everybody was. They hopped in the whale boat and they started pulling for open sea. Armed police turned up on the shore pretty quickly. Uh, one prisoner claims they opened fire on the boat from the shore, but uh, the rest of them don't. As in all these stories, you get different versions, slightly different versions from different people. They made it out to sea. They couldn't see the Katap anywhere initially. Then they saw her in the, in the distance. But before they could get anywhere near her, a storm blew up. Uh, the Georgette came along. Uh, the Georgette was made aware of what had happened. The, the two guys, by the way, had cut the telegraph wires. Um, the Georgette went to pick up reserve policemen who all bundled on board with all their weaponry. And uh, I'm not sure did the Georgette have an artillery piece or not. But she headed out looking for these escaped prisoners. There was a storm that night. The guys in the in the chase boat, in the whale boat, spent the night at sea in the storm. In the morning, they were trying to find the Catalpa and eventually found her again in the distance. As they rowed towards her, the Georgette turned up. They started pulling for the Catalpa. The Georgette realised what was happening, came after them. They piled into the... Catalpa hauled up the whale boat and headed for the open sea. And Georgette followed, caught up, demanded that they, that they stop. Captain Anthony said, all we have on board is free men. We're not stopping. We're, if you open fire on us, you're open fire on the American flag. Now, given the history of the War of 1812, which basically revolved around, well, partially revolved around, the idea of the Royal Navy stopping American ships at sea, usually looking for deserters, but the whole idea of interference with American shipping by the Royal Navy was one of the causes of the War of 1812. So it was a bit of a hot topic. So the Georgette didn't do anything. Catalpa made it away with the six prisoners. They, uh, they sailed for America. Uh, the captain had intended, Anthony had intended doing more whaling en route back to America. However, the prisoners were saying, come on, you know, who's paying for this trip? And also, we've been there for five years, hard labor. We want to go home. We want to, we want to go, we, 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 we want to go back to civilization. So they headed for civilization. They headed back to uh, America. When they got back to America, their uh, arrival was not expected. Uh, and then once word got out, they were there. There was big celebrations. There was, there was speeches. There was dinners. There was meetings. There was parades. There was uh, consternation on behalf of the British. And Captain Anthony didn't go to sea again because he could not have gone to a British port, and he could have been in trouble if he encountered a British vessel. They were uh, extremely pissed off about what had happened. Um, I'm sure his wife was very happy that that was the uh, upshot. The, the Fenians. It was a big shot in the arm for the Fenian movement. Um, they presented the Catalpa as a gift to uh, Anthony Richardson and uh, Sam Smith. Uh, the, the Fenians eventually, um, the, the name had become Clown and Gale by that stage in America. Um, it carried on as the IRB, the Irish Republican Brotherhood secret sworn organisation in the British Isles. And it was the movement behind the Easter Rising in 1916. The old Catalpa was eventually 
converted to a coal barge and then it was eventually condemned uh, in Belize many years later. Now there are books about this. There's a book called The Catalpa Expedition by a guy called Zephaniah Pease, P-E-A-S-E, and that's freely available as, as part of the Project Gutenberg on the internet. So you can find that whole book there um, in various formats. If you just Google Project Gutenberg Pease, P-E-A-S-E, Catalpa Expedition. Um, that was a book that was written in the 1890s, I think, with assistance from the captain, George Anthony. Uh, it has excerpts from the trials of some of the Fenians as well. Um, and basically it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very almost contemporary account of it. Uh, Anthony was quite involved. For a long time, the only book around was this one, which I happened to be lucky enough to inherit from my old man. Uh, Fremantle Mission by Sean O'Lewing which is uh, based on uh, his research as well as Pease's book. And then both of those books and his own research helped a guy called Peter Stevens write this great looking book, The Voyage of the Catalpa, um, which almost reads like a novel. And in fairness, the story is so good, somebody can make a movie of it. Uh, but that, that's the great book. You, these are hard to find, but if you look hard, you'll find them. The Voyage of the Catalpa, Peter Stevens, American. American researcher. There you have it. The story of the Catalpa. I hope you enjoy that. Thanks for sticking with it if you stayed all the way. And uh, maybe I'll see you again. Goodbye now. Mind yourselves.